Hey guys, thank you so much for clicking on today's video. My name is Annalise and this is my channel where we get planty with it. So it's Plantmas, which is just basically December in the plant community. And I know a lot of other YouTubers like to create extra videos during Plantmas just because people have more I think it's because people have more free time, downtime, they're home, so why not have more content to put out in the month of December? So I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to really bump up my content this month, so I'm hoping you guys are enjoying so far. I'm definitely in the holiday spirit today. I'm wearing my holiday fleece leggings. My mom actually got these for me, my boyfriend, her, my aunt, and then all five of our dogs have little matching outfits. Maybe I'll try to insert a picture of the dogs wearing it. But anyway, that's not the point of today's video. So today is gonna be a second part to a video I put out in November, which was the best rare and uncommon houseplants for beginners. This is the second part, which is the worst rare and uncommon houseplants for beginners. So if you wanna hear some plants that I've struggled with, other people have struggled with, then definitely keep on watching. So for this video, I took a lot from my own personal experience with houseplants. I also did put out a poll on my Instagram to see what kind of plants other people were struggling with, just to make sure that it wasn't maybe I just had a lot of bad luck with a certain plant, but a lot of these got submitted numerous times, so clearly it was kind of across the board people struggled with. First up is the Philodendron Melanochrysum. So she is a beauty. She has this deep, deep green foliage. They sometimes come out, the leaves can come out a little bit more orangey. It's kind of similar to a micans, but usually the leaves are a lot bigger. And when they mature, they get really long and beautiful. So the reason this is on this list is because it's a difficult plant in my experience. This is a prime example of what the leaves do a lot of the time. They don't unfurl all the way. You can see this has been like this for a month. It's not unfurling anymore. It's just gonna look crusty like that. Sometimes they get stuck in the sheath and they rip. I've given my friend two cuttings of this plant and they both rotted instantly when she put them in sphagnum. So it's just a difficult, annoying plant. It sucks because when it grows, it's so gorgeous. I mean, you guys can tell this leaf is like so stunning. Like the back is so pretty. So I'm really trying with this plant. I'm not giving up on it. And if you're dedicated, you can try it. But I think I wouldn't start out with this plant because it can be definitely on the more difficult side. Also, for me at least, it's been a pest magnet. Spider mites seem to love, at least in my collection, the velvety philodendrons. And this is one of those, so that's been kind of a difficult part of it too. I feel like I'm constantly having to treat the melano for spider mites. In a similar vein, another velvety philodendron. So warning, mine does look pretty crusty, which I'm very sad about, but I'll show you guys anyway. This is the Philodendron Varicosum. So you can kind of get a sense of like how beautiful the leaves are. I'll post a picture of when I first got my Varicosum. It put out some really stunning leaves. It was good for about two months. And then since it's just been constantly downhill. So yeah, this is one example. It also has the issue with leaves ripping or not unfurling all the way. I have no idea how this damage happened because it was literally living in my greenhouse cabinet, it has good humidity. It's not too bright light because it doesn't like super bright light, but still unhappy. And then this leaf is basically dead. Like you can tell, um, it has spider mites as well. I'm treating it right now and I don't see any on it currently, but that's what happened to this leaf. But this guy, it's not even the spider mites that are the main problem. It just seems to grow really poorly for me. And I've seen some super beautiful varicosums that people have. So I don't know if Maybe I'm unlucky, but I did have a few people submit that on Instagram. So I think across the board, they're maybe just a little bit more on the difficult side. The velvety philodendrons a lot of the time do need higher humidity. And I know, I know when I was starting out collecting plants, I wasn't really at the level of wanting humidifiers in my space or having a greenhouse cabinet. So if you're just starting out and you want to try a rare plant, I don't think I would try most of the velvety philodendrons because they do have just higher needs and can be a lot more difficult. Okay, next up is another philodendron, but not a velvety philodendron. I just cut this guy back yesterday and I put a ton of little cuttings in my prop box. So I'm hoping, hoping against hope that something turns out good in there. But the next plant on my list is the philodendron brantianum. So this is a beautiful plant. I mean, you can see the beautiful silvery, I mean, this leaf doesn't even look great to be honest, but you can see that the leaves have this beautiful silvery color. They're so pretty. They can vine, they can climb, whatever you want. But for some reason, all the bigger leaves came with the plant originally. And then after that point, it just puts out these tiny little twerpy leaves like this guy. 
I cut off a bunch of them to put in my prop box, but I didn't get any leaves basically bigger than this after the initial leaves, which is very frustrating. It also has the problem with a lot of leaves not coming out all the way or like coming out with this weird half translucent piece or not coming out at all. You can see like this guy's struggling to escape right there and here's like the tiny leaf above it. And I know this is not just a me problem. I've seen other people's brandies in person and in pictures and a lot of people seem to have the same exact struggle. So I don't know what it is with the brandianum. I put mine in my cabinet because I was thinking, okay, humidity, sometimes that helps leaves come out of sheets without ripping, et cetera, et cetera. Didn't matter, it didn't care. It still looked super crusty. So I cut a ton of it off. I think I'm actually going to let go of this bottom part because these leaves are not looking great. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to remake the plant from my cuttings and I don't know, maybe I'll try a different medium. Maybe I'll try soil. If you had luck with your brandy, comment down below because I really have seen some beautiful ones and I really want that, but maybe it's just not in the cards for me. The next one, ugh, I can't stand this plant right now. I have high hopes for it. Actually, I don't even have high hopes for it. I just can't stand it right now. So next up is a philodendron lupinum, which I had not heard a lot about until how did I end up getting one? I don't even remember. I think it like came with another order. I got a little baby cutting or something. Here it is. So this is also a velvet leaf philodendron, but the leaves are super heart shaped and they're a really deep green. When they get bigger, they are very beautiful, but this guy for some reason matures so slowly. It's on a pole and I'm really trying, but this is the leaf size we have right now. And the last two leaves have both not unfurled. They've literally gotten stuck and then crested over and died. So I don't know what the issue is with that. And I know this is not just me. My friend Gabe, the one who you guys saw on my channel the other day, he has a lupinum. It looks way, way better than mine, but he said it did take a really long time for the leaves to mature and get to a bigger size. So I think that's just kind of universally what's going on with philodendron lupinum. So if you want a plant that is gonna grow big leaves or at least size up relatively quickly, this is not the plant for you. If you don't wanna get frustrated with leaves dying in sheets, this is not the plant for you. So I don't think I'd really recommend this plant to anyone almost. I'm sure there are people who love this plant and swear by it, but for some reason it just is not my cup of tea. Hello. Okay, so for some weird reason, after I took my work call, the second half of the video did not record properly. I could not download the file from my camera, so bummer, but it's two days later, and so I'm re-recording the second half, so sorry for the change in placement, lighting, outfit, everything, but just bear with me. I really wanna get through the rest of this list because I think there's some important plants that I definitely wanna mention. So I think I had finished talking about the philodendron lupinum in the last part, if I didn't, long story short, it takes really long to mature. A lot of the leaves have trouble coming out and it's just kind of twerpy in general. So I don't think I'd recommend that for beginners. Okay, moving right along. Next up is a kind of a category of plants. There are two main plants within this category that I wanna talk about. So the category is variegated monsteras. Now I know there's a ton of different types of variegated monsteras. There's the aria, the mint, all these new different types of variegated monstera, but specifically I'm gonna focus on the monstera alba, which is the white variegated one, and the monstera tie constellation. So first up with the monstera alba, I would not recommend getting an unrooted cutting. If you can find a rooted cutting or a potted plant of an alba, I think go for it. I understand why a lot of times people gravitate towards rooted cuttings or chunks because they are a lot cheaper and this plant is on the more expensive side. However, I've heard of countless issues with rooting unrooted monstera albos. They apparently rot super easily. And especially if you have just a node, if it rots, you're kind of done. You, there's nothing else you can do. And a lot of times sellers won't refund you because as long as the node or the cutting arrived healthily to you, they don't really compensate for what happens after that. So just something to be aware of. If you're buying a cutting, at least make sure there's some amount of aerial root because that immensely increases your chances of getting it to root successfully. I would also recommend if you're rooting, if you're comfortable with it, instead of rooting it in water, I would try rooting it in sphagnum. When I got my unrooted elbow cutting, I rooted it in sphagnum and thankfully that went fine. But I've just heard of so many people who have rotted their monstera elbows and it's really a bummer. So one thing to just note. On the other hand, monstera tie constellations seem to rot a lot even after rooting. I know tons of people who say this plant rots constantly. Mine actually started rotting a little bit on the roots and I had to trim the rot off. Um, 
I know Wild Fern, who I'm sure all of you know, she has an entire playlist of all the times her Thai constellation has rotted. I think it's been like four or five times at this point. So it seems like a pretty universal experience that the Thai constellation will randomly just start rotting. So unless you're really comfortable dealing with rot or identifying when rot is happening and taking care of it, then I'd probably stay away from the Thai constellation for now, which I know is hard because it's such, such, such a beauty. But with the price point, it's definitely a risk to take with the likelihood of rot. Okay, now, on my Instagram poll, a lot of people sent in specific plants. Quite a few people sent in entire genuses of plants that they would warn people against. So let me go through those. First up is, I think this one was the most submitted and that was Anthurium. So I have my little sample Anthurium here today. This is an Anthurium Regal. I think I have three Anthurium total. And this one is a single leaf. As you can tell, it's in the one leaf club. It's a super cute leaf. There is some damage over on the side there. I'm not really sure what happened, but that seems to be a thing that just kind of happens with Anthurium sometimes. So I think the reason that people listed this one is because they have pretty specific humidity needs. Now, I don't know if this is across the board for all Anthurium, but I'll say at least for the three I have, which is this one, the Regal, a Pappy and a Crystallinum, they do all seem to prefer higher humidity. I keep all of mine in a greenhouse cabinet. Actually, my Crystallinum is in the prop box right now because the entire thing rotted, which is a whole nother situation, but I think that's what makes them kind of difficult. A lot of beginners probably don't have a very intense humidity setup. When I started, I remember being like, I'm never gonna get a humidifier for my plants. That's too much. I'm never gonna get a greenhouse cabinet. That's way overkill. And I think a lot of people maybe feel that way, which is totally fine. Those things are expensive and unnecessary for most houseplants. But I will say with Anthurium, they do seem to not do as well without the higher humidity conditions. Now, if you're okay with your Anthurium not looking perfect or kind of browning and having some crust around the edges, but you don't really care as long as it's alive and still growing, then you can probably keep it in regular room humidity. But if you want those really beautiful, photogenic, perfect, velvety leaves, then you probably need a higher humidity condition. Okay, moving on from Anthurium. Next up is a genus that gets just so much hate across the board from everybody. I don't know, well, I do know why. I think this genus is incredibly beautiful. I think it has some of the most beautiful foliage of any genus. And I think that's why a lot of people, especially people new into the houseplant world are drawn to it. I know I definitely was. You can probably guess what genus I'm going for at this point, but that is the Calathea, which I think has recently been reclassified as a Japersia. Just a note, I don't know too much about that, but I've heard that. So the sample Calathea I have here today is the only Calathea I have in my collection right now, and that is the Calathea Warshuekii, also known as the Jungle Velvet. So you can see it has these really dark, deep green velvety leaves, and the backs of the leaves are this beautiful purple color. I really love this plant. I mean, you can tell it's a stunner, such a statement piece, and these leaves can get really massive. I mean, this is the biggest leaf we've gotten so far, but they can get a lot bigger than that. The challenge with Calathea, which I'm sure you can already see, is they crisp really easily. So we've had a couple leaves that have just been coming out for some reason with this like crispiness on top, which is definitely odd because it's been in the same exact conditions it's been in when it grew all these other healthy leaves. So I don't exactly know what's happening. I've checked it for pests, who knows? But it seems like Calathea brown and crisp really easily if something very minor is wrong in their environment. So they love super high humidity and they're really finicky about their water type. So I've noticed with Calathea, they really prefer distilled water as opposed to tap water. I know tap water is different everywhere, so some people do have really high quality tap water, and in that case, you're probably fine. But with New York City tap water, I think it is hard water, and so it doesn't seem to love that. It seems to make the leaves crisp up way more easily. I know most people aren't really willing to commit to the level of, let me buy a water distiller, or let me purchase special distilled water for my plants. That's definitely a lot. So the water needs are definitely something to consider with Calathea. And then the other thing about Calathea that I think people hate is that they are pest magnets. I will say I have to agree on that. This guy has had spider mites so many times. Well, actually not recently. It had a really bad spider mite infection infestation and I cut it almost all the way back. There were probably like two or three leaves left and I treated the heck out of those three leaves. And since then it's grown back beautifully and it didn't even take that long to grow back and hasn't had pests since that point. But I kind of keep it not near any other plants. It's kind of on an isolated shelf by itself so it doesn't risk having anything touch it because it seems like the second a spider mite's near it, it's done, it's covered. Your leaves are gonna look really crusty. They're gonna start yellowing and all that. So. I think Calathea are a beautiful plant. I understand why beginners are drawn to them for sure. I think when I first started collecting plants, I 
Why am I holding it like that? Okay. Um, I definitely had a few Clavia. I had an Orbifolia. I had a Zabrina and a Mosaica. Killed all three. As you can see, they're not here. And I didn't sell them or trade. They were something. They all died. So I think just something to be aware of. Just a caveat, this video is not to try to scare you away from any sort of plant or tell you like you can't get this plant, you can't do it or anything like that. That's not at all what I'm saying. This is just supposed to be, if you're thinking about venturing into more rare or uncommon plants, some things to consider with certain plants. So if you're like, I don't mind plants that need super high humidity, then a lot of the ones on this list you'll be totally fine with. Or if you're like, oh, I have distilled water in spades, a lot of these you'll be completely fine with. This is just if you're thinking about, oh, maybe I'll get a philodendron lupinum. Some things to consider with that plant. As you can tell, I really don't like the lupinum, but it's fine. Okay, moving quite along. We have two more genuses left. So next up is another genus that was submitted quite a bit, and that is the alocasia. My sample alocasia here today is an alocasia Friedeck, which I think is my favorite alocasia. This one is special to me because these were the first corms I actually grew successfully. There are two little corms in here. Corms are the little baby nubs that alocasia put out that you can separate and plant and get new plants from them. So I'm very proud of this guy. You can see up here, it's putting out a new leaf. It might be hard to see, but it is right there. To be honest, I'm not sure the exact reason that people said alocasia are a more challenging plant. I definitely killed the first alocasia I had, which is an alocasia poly, when it was living in soil. But I've noticed when I keep alocasia in either LECA or SPAG or Prolite, they seem to do really well because I feel like I don't stress so much about watering. In soil, I can never tell when alocasia really need water. Whereas in SPAG, I just make sure to keep it damp, not soaking wet. There's no water reservoir or anything like that but just make sure it's damp at all times. And I've had a ton of success with alocasia that way. So if you're struggling with alocasia in soil, maybe consider trying a different medium. Maybe that will be the kicker for what lets you keep alocasia successful in your collection because there are some really stunning ones. Specifically, I've been loving the dragon scale alocasia lately. I hated cupria. I've mentioned it a few times that I think they look like bugs, but then I saw Gabe's Cupria. Side note, if you haven't seen Gabe's video, I did a video with him a few days ago of showing his top five favorite plants. And he had a Cupria, which I think might've been the first one I really saw in person. And I was like, do I like this? Maybe, maybe I do, I don't know. I think I do. Anyway, alocasia are, I think maybe a little bit difficult, but this is one that I think you can definitely be more willing to try especially if you're willing to try out various mediums to see what works best for you. Okay, last but definitely not least is begonia. Now, I only have one begonia, which is this guy. There's technically two different types in this pot. This first one is a begonia Linda Dawn. It has these beautiful super red backs here. And the second one is, I don't know the name of it, I forget, but it has these beautiful kind of polka dotty dots. Um, hmm. Begonia also need high humidity, unfortunately. I've noticed they will survive outside of a high humidity environment, but they just start to get really crispy and brown. Now, if that doesn't bother you, I don't think they're gonna die completely or anything like that. The leaves will just look a little bit less ideal. But if that doesn't bother you at all, then I think you can definitely keep begonia anywhere, except terrarium begonia. So make sure when you're buying a begonia, you check if it's a terrarium begonia or not. Terrarium begonia need like extremely high humidity. They're meant to live in a terrarium, which has like probably 90% humidity or something. So probably steer away from those unless you have a specific terrarium setup. But still begonia in general, I found the most success when I keep them in a cabinet or next to a humidifier. I don't know what it is about begonia. I just... I haven't found any I'm obsessed with. Like, I don't really look at any begonia and go, mm, I really love that. Whereas with other genuses, I'm like, I'll see a philodendron and I'm like, yes, yes. So begonia, I don't know. Maybe I'm not the right person for them. Maybe I'm underselling them. I know there are some beautiful ones and I know there are a lot of people that adore begonia, but unfortunately that is not me. Okay, I think that about wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed and definitely comment down below if you disagree with any of my selections or agree with them. I did really try to pick plants that numerous people selected, not just ones that I've had a difficult experience with. So hopefully this was a little bit helpful or maybe not helpful at all and that's totally fine. <laughs> Anyway, comment down below and consider subscribing if you enjoyed this video. I really want to hit a thousand by January 1st or December 31st. 
that would be so outstanding to go into 2022 with a thousand subscribers we'll see if that happens i don't know it might be a little ambitious anyway if you haven't subscribed definitely consider it and i will see you next time bye